The Irish election takes place on Saturday the 8th of February. In this video I'm going to talk about the Irish electoral system and how it works. I'm going to talk about the differences between the major parties. I'm also going to do a brief run through of all the elections held in Ireland since independence to give some type of context to this year's election. And then finally I'm going to talk about the campaign for this election, some of the major issues and what we can expect to happen on Saturday. I'll include timestamps in the video description for each of these different sections so you can skip ahead to the section that you're most interested in. The lower house of the Irish Parliament is called the Doyle. This is where all the power is. The Irish Prime Minister needs to command a majority in the Doyle. Ireland also has an upper house called the Shannad and also a president. The current president is Michael D. Higgins. The Shannad and the President don't have a lot of power, so we really don't need to worry too much about them, so I'm not going to be talking about them in this video. We do need to familiarise ourselves with a small number of Irish language terms if we're going to be talking about Irish politics. So the Doyle, that's the lower house of the Irish Parliament. The Taoiseach is the term used for the Prime Minister. It literally means chieftain. TD means Member of Parliament. It literally means uh, Dola. It means a member of the Doyle or a deputy of the Doyle. This is a map of the constituencies in Ireland. This is the map from 2016. It's changed a little bit for this election. Offaly and Leash have been merged and some of the borders have been changed a little bit, but otherwise it's, it's the same. Now in Ireland, each of these constituencies are multi-seat constituencies. So each constituency has between three and five seats. Now this is important because it makes it more difficult for the larger parties to gain majorities and it makes it easier for smaller parties and independents to win seats. Now, Ireland has an unusually large number of independents in the parliament and very often in the past these independents have held the balance of power. So this is a feature of Irish politics, these independents in the Doyle. This is what an Irish voting ballot looks like. Ireland uses a system called the single transferable vote. So you rank your all of the candidates in your order of preference. Now, how it works is they calculate a quota which each candidate needs to win a seat. I'll explain in the video description exactly how the quota is worked out. They then count all the votes and if all the seats aren't filled, if um, if the candidates don't have enough, that they don't meet the quota, which is what usually happens, they then start eliminating the lowest ranked candidate. So the candidate who comes last, they eliminate him or her and then they redistribute the votes according to who was number two on each of those ballots. So say, for example, you vote number one, Mr. Brown, number two, Mr. Smith. If Mr. Brown is eliminated, then your vote goes to Mr. Smith. And so they keep doing that. They keep eliminating candidates until they fill the however, however many seats there are in the constituency. So this is a quite straightforward system for the voter. All you have to do is go in and um, rank the candidates. You can rank as many or as little as you want. You can just write one or you can go all the way down to maybe 15. There's sometimes there's as many as 15 candidates. But it's very complicated for the people doing the counting. And this is why in Ireland you're not going to get results on the night of the election. You're going to have to wait until the next day. It also makes it more complicated to predict the results of elections because you need to bear in mind not just first preference but also how people are going to vote number two, number three, because preferences are and transferred votes have an impact and also decide seats. These are the largest six parties in Ireland. Before we start talking about the individual parties, let's just talk about the names. So Sinn Féin, that means um, we ourselves in Irish. Sinn Féin are a very old party and this, this name was chosen in the early 1900s. At that point, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom and the idea was to stress the need for Ireland to stand apart. Green Party, Labour, Social Democrats, that's all straightforward. Fianna Foyle means warriors of destiny. Fine Gael means clan of the Gaels. The Gaels are the, were the Irish, were the Celtic tribe rather, who came to Ireland um, and gave Ireland um, the Irish language. That's where the word Gaelic comes from. So Gael is really just a synonym for Irish. Let's start then with Sinn Féin. Now this election has been all about Sinn Féin. They've been surging in the polls. 
They're a controversial party for a number of reasons. First of all, there's widespread concern in the media and amongst Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, which are the two largest parties in Ireland. There's a lot of concern about the influence that members of the IRA, or I should say the ex-IRA, because the IRA no longer exists, so former members of the ex-IRA and the influence that they have over Sinn Féin. Now, the highest authority in Sinn Féin, it's not the TDs like Mary Lou Macdonald, the leader. It's not the members of parliament. It's the Ord Corla, which is the name of the High Council. And this is made up of Republican activists. So these aren't elected people. And there's a lot of discussion in the media about this Ord Corla and the type of people who are on it and the relationship between this Ord Corla and the TDs in the parliament. And basically there's a lot of um, beating around the bush and there's a lot of use of euphemisms and so on. But basically it boils down to is there's, there's a belief that Sinn Féin are controlled by ex-IRA members. That's who the Ord Corla is, ex-IRA or people close to ex-IRA, and that they basically tell the TDs in the parliament what to do, that the TDs are just mouthpieces. One of the moderators in one of the debates for this year's election asked Mary Lou Macdonald whether the TDs in the Doyle, the Sinn Féin TDs, whether they're just, quote, messenger boys for this Ord Corla. Michal Martin in the debates also talked about this. He talked about shadowy figures on the Ord Corla and um, a lack of transparency in the party. Leo Varadkar, he also said it's not a normal party. They were talking about this because Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael won't go into coalition with Sinn Féin and they were explaining that this was one of the reasons, this unusual situation in the party, this power that the Ord Corla has. There was a notorious incident in 2018 when Mary Lou Macdonald said that the time wasn't right to hold a referendum on a united Ireland because of the uncertainty surrounding Brexit and then the very next day she changed her position she reversed her position and said that actually she was in favour of holding a referendum and it was widely believed in the media that she made that change after being told to do so by these shadowy figures as, as Micheál Martin calls them. Pader Tobin, who left Sinn Féin over the issue of abortion and founded a new party. I'll talk about them in a moment. He has also said in an interview that Sinn Féin TDs have, quote, zero influence over policy and that policy is decided by a circle of six or seven people. This has also been an issue in Northern Ireland. Um, the finance minister was involved in, a, in an incident where he wasn't able to agree to a policy before he checked back with, with these people. During the election campaign, the Irish Times ran a story about this, um, saying that the Sinn Féin TDs signed a pledge to be guided by the Ord Corla. And in case you can't read this, I'll, in case it's too small, I'll read it out. The pledge which Sinn Féin requires all candidates to sign, so all candidates for um, the Doyle, promises that, quote, in all matters pertaining to the duties and functions of an elected representative, I will be guided by and hold myself amenable to all directions and instructions issued to me by on Ord Corla of Sinn Féin. So why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because the IRA was involved in um, various criminal activities or it was believed to be involved in various criminal activities, um, not just shootings and bombings, but bank robberies, kidnappings and smuggling. Now, there's a concern that there are still people in the Republican movement, people who have influence over Sinn Féin, so... And some of these people may still be involved in Ill illegal activity, especially smuggling and fuel laundering. So if we get Sinn Féin into government, you're effectively giving these people a seat at the government desk. And remember, the IRA killed members of the Republic's security forces during the Troubles. So there would be... People in the police and the army in the Republic of Ireland who wouldn't be too crazy about the idea of Sinn Féin being in government. A related issue then is the Special Criminal Court, which is a court which the Republic uses for dealing with very serious crimes like terrorism and organised crime. Now, Sinn Féin has historically been opposed to this. And um, Micheál Martin of Fianna Fáil, again in one of the debates, he said that the reason Sinn Féin are opposed to this is because the Special Criminal Court had been used very effectively against the IRA during the trouble. And the, quote, old IRA comrades would never support the Special Criminal Court. And Mary Lou Macdonald was asked about this in one of the debates. 
She was asked six consecutive times by the moderator whether she supported the special criminal court and she kept giving, trying to avoid the question and she eventually said that it wasn't Sinn Féin's policy to abolish the special criminal court but she didn't say that she actually supported it. The numbers down the bottom here, they represent the, the polling figures, the, the average of the, the most recent polls, what those parties have been getting. So there are other issues with Sinn Féin, other, other reasons why Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are reluctant to deal with them and why the media think that they, um, they would be um, bad for the country if they got in. You have their left-wing economic policies. They want to introduce 16 new taxes for a total of 4 billion euros. In one of the debates, um, Leo Varadkar said that these tax plans would, quote, torpedo the Irish economy. Michal Martin said they would um, destroy enterprise in this country. They're also left-wing on social issues like abortion and gay marriage, etc., which led to uh, this splinter group being formed by um, Pater Tobin. Now, I don't want to be just negative about Sinn Féin. I mean, they're doing very well at the moment. So, I mean, let's talk about some positive things about the party. There's a tremendous amount of energy around it, a lot of enthusiasm, young people, dynamism, um, much more so than the established parties. And I think there's a mood for change in the country and an issue, a recurring issue in Irish politics is that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are, are viewed as too similar. Now, Fine Gael are the party in government at the moment, so Fianna Fáil would be the obvious choice for an alternative. But there, there's a sense that they're too similar and Sinn Féin are, are more, more of a, a, an option or more different, that they're the only real different um, choice that you can have. Sinn Féin's housing policy is um, also very popular with voters. This is one of the major issues. We've seen that from opinion polls. There's a, a big housing crisis in Ireland at the moment. There aren't enough houses. People can't get houses. And when they can, they're too expensive. Rents are too high as well. So all of the political parties are very keen to address this by, um, by building new houses. And Sinn Féin have by far the most ambitious plan. They plan to build 100,000 new houses. So this is, a, this is something which has resonated with voters. Voters. So the Green Party are a, a pretty normal European Green Party. They've seen a bit of a, a boost in the polls recently, like a lot of Green Parties in Europe. A unique aspect of green policies in Irish is that the size of the farming sector. The farming sector is very important in Ireland and the Green Party want to reduce the size of the national cattle herd to reduce greenhouse emissions. So this is maybe a, a more important issue in Ireland than it is maybe in, in most other European countries. And there's some pushback from the other parties on this. Um, Fine Gael, which traditionally represents the larger farmers, they've criticised this. They're, they don't support a reduction in the cattle herd and perhaps a bit more surprising Sinn Féin on the left they've also um, they're also opposed to carbon taxes on fuels they say that um, it's not fair on people living in rural communities who need to drive and people who are living in older homes who need fuel to heat their homes so there there is some pushback against the greens labor are a pretty normal social democrats um they're, well, they're, they're social democrats. There's also a party called the Social Democrats, but I mean, Labour could easily be called that as well. They're, they're a pretty standard centre-left party. The only unusual thing about them is how small they are. I mean, most countries in Europe, the Labour Party would either be the biggest or the second biggest party. But in Ireland, they've only ever been junior partners in a coalition. They're currently on around 5%. and um, They have been much higher in the past. Maybe around 20% is about as high as they've got. The Social Democrats are a relatively recent breakaway group from Labour. They're a bit more moderate. They talk about the Nordic model. The Nordic model is a bit closer to the centre than social democracy. Social democracy is capitalism with um, a lot of state intervention and nationalisation of industries. Um, Nordic model is you still have high levels of taxes, a lot of redistribution of wealth, generous welfare state, but a little bit less um, nationalisation. It's a little bit more moderate, a little bit more close to the centre. So then we come to Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. So a big issue in this election has been that they're, they're quite similar. Okay, so in order to understand who these parties are and why they exist and why we have two parties that are quite similar to each other in Ireland. We really, you really need to have a basic grasp of what happened in Ireland in the early 1900s. 
1916, there was the 1916 Rising, the Easter Rising. That was a conventional war. It was a conventional attempt to take control of Dublin and to establish an Irish Republic. Now, it was a relatively small event. I mean, it caused a lot of destruction, a lot of deaths, but the number of people involved was relatively small. It didn't last long and it didn't have a lot of public support. The Rising was defeated and most of the leaders were executed. And three years later, there was a second war. This was the Anglo-Irish War. Now, this, these were the same people. Again, it was the IRA, and they proclaimed their allegiance to the Irish Republic, which had been proclaimed in 1916. But this was very different to the 1916 Rising. This was a guerrilla war. It, was, um, it lasted much longer, more people involved, and this had overwhelming support, at least from the Catholic population of Ireland. Now, this ended in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. Now, the IRA in the Anglo-Irish War, which is also called the Irish War of Independence, um, the IRA had been fighting for a 32-county Irish Republic. Now, what they got in the Anglo-Irish Treaty was partition, so the, the establishment of Northern Ireland. The Anglo-Irish Treaty didn't actually establish that. It had been established in a previous bit of legislation, but it, it further entrenched it. It further copper-fastened the existence of Northern Ireland. Now, as strange as this may seem, that wasn't a big issue at the time because there was a widespread assumption that Northern Ireland wasn't going to last. So when we're talking about the Anglo-Irish Treaty being controversial, partition wasn't really a big issue. A much bigger issue was dominion status. So it created the Irish Free State. Ireland left the United Kingdom, became the Irish Free State, which was a dominion with the same legal status as Canada or South Africa or Australia. Now, this was controversial because it wasn't quite f fully independent. Dominions weren't fully independent until 1931, the Statute of Westminster. So at the time, you know, a lot of people weren't happy about this. It was maybe, I suppose you could say it was maybe 80, 85% independent. And the third controversial aspect of the treaty was the oath. So the members of the new parliament in the Irish Free State, they had to sign, um, make this oath. Now, I'll include the text of the oath in the video description if you're interested, but there was, there was a lot of debate whether this oath was or was not an oath of allegiance to the King of England. I mean, you can read the text yourself and decide, but this was a big issue at the time. Now, Sinn Féin was the dominant political party in Ireland at that stage, and they were split on this. One faction was in favour of the treaty. That was Fine Gael. So they were the pro-treaty faction. So the pro-treaty faction of Sinn Féin left and formed a new party called Fine Gael. I'm simplifying things a little bit here. They, they had a different name initially, but effectively that's what Fine Gael is. Sinn Féin were the dominant party at the time. Um, they supported what, what the IRA were doing. And a lot of people would have been members of Sinn Féin and the IRA. Now, Fianna Fáil, they were the anti-treaty faction, so they left Sinn Féin as well. You also had a small number of people left behind in Sinn Féin. They were the really hardcore anti-treaty faction. And that, that faction would eventually, through many twists and turns, become the Sinn Féin party that exists today. So there was really a three-way split. Sinn Féin, which was this huge party which dominated Ireland at the time, it split into Fine Gael, the pro-treaty faction, and Fianna Fáil, the anti-treaty faction, and, and the small remainder then became the Sinn Féin of today. Now, the IRA also split on this. Those who were in favour of the, the treaty left the IRA and joined the new National Army or the Free State Forces. Those who were opposed stayed in the IRA. They were known as the Irregulars, the Irregular IRA. So they were the anti-treaty faction. And there was a civil war fought in Ireland in 1922 and 1923 between these two forces. And this, was, this civil war was really nasty. There were atrocities committed on both sides. A lot of them coming from the free state side, it has to be said. And this created real bitterness and lasting division and wounds. Now, Fianna Fáil eventually reconciled themselves to the Irish free state and they tried to reform it from within, but the, the irregular IRA never did. And that irregular IRA would eventually, through many twists and turns, become the provisional IRA that we associate with Northern Ireland in the 1970s and 80s. And the that IRA, they only really recognised the legitimacy of the Republic of Ireland in the 1980s. So that's the origin of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. That's why the two parties have never come together, because there's a lot of bad blood there. 
of course, a hundred years on, um, things aren't the same anymore. I, I don't think it's inconceivable that there might be some type of merger in the future, but that's certainly why there hasn't been a merger in the past. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. They're often said that the, the two parties are the same. It's not quite true. There are differences between them. So let's talk about what those differences are. So Fianna Foyle is, in rural areas, it would be more small farmers. In urban areas, it would be more working class. I, I've put People's Party down there because there, it's not a party that's associated strongly with any social group or even any political ideology, really. I suppose you could call it Big Tent as well. Fine Gael, on the other hand, there's definitely more of a bourgeois, middle-class vibe about that party. In rural areas, large farmers support them, and middle-class middle, middle class, um, Dublin people support them. For example, in the early days of the state, the Protestant and the Unionist minority also gravitated towards Fine Gael. Now, Fianna Fáil are more socially conservative. We saw this in the 2018 abortion on referendum. Both their TDs and the Doyle, they they were split pretty much 50-50 when it came to the vote on abortion. And then when there was the referendum, their party base was also split about 50-50. And we saw from exit polls that Fianna Fáil voters were 50-50 on abortion, but Fine Gael voters were 75-25 in favour of it. So Fine Gael voters were considerably more um, liberal. Um, also the Fine Gael TDs um, nearly all voted for, for the abortion bill. Now, having said that, the two parties, there is a broad consensus on most issues. I mean, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael generally take a moderate centre-right approach to most things. They both support the, the Irish economic model, which is low taxes, bring in lots of foreign direct investment, foreign multinationals, export-oriented, pro-business. But Fine Gael has generally been more ideologically committed to that, because Fianna Fáil in the past has been a bit a bit more to the left, a bit more populist. Like Fine Gael is the party you would associate more with lowering taxes. But there, there is general consensus on them, pretty much everything. Like when it comes to Northern Ireland, Brexit, the EU. There's, there's very little difference between the two parties, to be fair. Okay, so these are six of the, the smaller parties. By far, the largest of these are Solidarity, People Before Profit. I've put an asterisk beside Richard Boyd Barrett's name because he's not actually the official leader of them, but he's the most high profile member. I think they have a joint leadership, um, but he's he's very high profile in the media. He's very good in debates. So these guys are, are left wing democratic socialists. They have their roots in various working class um, community groups. I suppose there are similarities to Podemos in Spain, that these guys, they don't get a lot of votes or win a lot of seats, but they definitely punch above their weights. Um, as I said, Richard Boyd Barrett is, is very good. He's a very good communicator. He comes across very good, well in debates. So Ain2, that's the breakaway faction of Sinn Féin that I mentioned, so that Pater Tobin left Sinn Féin over the issue of abortion. So they're Republicans and they're left-wing, but they're a little bit closer to the centre and they're more socially conservative than Sinn Féin and they don't have this strong connection to the ex-IRA that um, Sinn Féin have. Ain2, by the way, means um, unity in Irish. Um, renewa means like renew in Irish. It's a play on the Irish word for new. That's basically a breakaway faction from Fine Gael, also over the issue of abortion. But they're probably the last party here that we could consider within the mainstream. Um, they're pretty much national conservative. They're the only mainstream party that talks about immigration. Now, I've put dashes in the bottom field there because with the exception of people before profit, a lot of these parties aren't included in opinion polls. They don't have a lot of support. And it's possible that people before profit solidarity will be the only party here that will actually win a seat in the election. But nonetheless, I think they're interesting parties. So that's why I want to talk about them. So the other three parties, I think now we're moving into the area. These these are parties that are labelled by the media as being far-right extremists or racists and so on. The Irish Freedom Party, they're pretty much a modern, secular, national conservative party. They're all about Ireland exit, so Ireland leaving the European Union. That used to be in the party name. They don't use that so much anymore, but Ireland exit is still a big part of their platform. So they have moderate centre-right economic policies. They talk a lot about immigration and they're socially conservative. The National Party, they talk a lot about God and religion. And this is more of a traditional Catholic 
Irish Nationalist Party. They use a lot of imagery from 1916. Um, they talk about Ireland for the Irish. They use the Irish language a lot, talk about immigration. They talk less about the EU and the economy. So I think it's fair to say that they're um, right wing as opposed to centre right. ACI, Anti-Corruption Ireland, this was founded by the journalist um, Gemma O'Doherty. Despite the, the name corruption, um, Gemma O'Doherty really talks a lot about immigration, globalism, George Soros. I mean, at times she can veer into Alex Jones type territory. She uploaded a video about a week ago talking about the New World Order poisoning Ireland's water supply with um, fluoride. John Waters, who's quite a well-known journalist in Ireland, he's standing under this platform in the election. He's more moderate. He talks more about immigration and birth rates. So these three parties, um, the Freedom Party, National Party and Gemma O'Doherty, they'd all generally be um, on quite friendly terms with each other. They'd have more in common with each other than not. But there, there are differences between the three of them. Okay, so I want to do a quick run through of Irish electoral history. Okay, so this table here, the column on the left, there are the various elections that have been held, 1922, 1923. The numbers represent the percentage of the vote that the various parties got, and the coloured boxes mean that that party formed the government after the election. Now, I've simplified this a little bit. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael had different names in the early years, and I've left out some smaller parties. There have been various smaller parties that popped up. They got maybe 5-10% of the vote, but none of those parties lasted for more than two or three years, so I haven't included them. The only exception to that is the Progressive Democrats, who were a party in the late 80s and early 90s, and they had a significant influence on economic policy, so that's why I included them. So the first four governments of the Irish Free State were formed by Fine Gael, or Cumann na Noel, as it was called back then. The Prime Minister um, was W.T. Cosgrave. They didn't yet use the term Taoiseach, but he was effectively the Taoiseach of the time. This was a very moderate government. It has been commented that it's unusual after a revolution for such a moderate government to take place. So these guys were quite moderate, pragmatic, centre-right. In 1932, Eamon de Valera and Fianna Foyle take over. And de Valera was this huge figure in Irish history. He was Taoiseach eight times, more if you include some of the governments during the Revolutionary Era. He was also president twice after he stood down as Taoiseach. Now, de Valera had a very different vision for Ireland compared to Fine Gael, who were very much moderate. Back then, the differences between Fine, Fine Gael and Fianna Foyle were more pronounced. So de Valera wanted to turn Ireland towards protectionism and import substitution and self-sufficiency. He also um, he gave a famous speech in 1943 on the radio for St. Patrick's Day called The Ireland That We Dreamed Of, and it was a pretty good summary of the type of Ireland that he wanted. He talked about villages full of, and these are all direct quotes, um, co cosy homesteads, happy maidens, and athletic youths, and a a people happy with frugal comforts who were more interested in spiritual matters than material rewards. So this was a very traditional conservative society. De Valera was a devout Catholic and during this, during his time as Taoiseach he brought in a new constitution which included the phrase that the state recognises the special position of the Catholic Church. That was removed later on but it gives you a, a, a sign of uh, a glimpse into his, his ideology. And this was the high point of the influence of the Catholic Church in Ireland. So de Valera did a lot of constitutional work during this time. He undid the controversial aspects of the Anglo-Irish Treaty and he moved Ireland towards basically effectively being 100% independent. His economic policy, however, wasn't so successful. Generally, the Irish economy didn't do well during this period. In fact, Pretty much the entire time, nearly all of these elections that I'm going to be talking about took place against a backdrop of stagnant economy, high unemployment and high emigration. There were only a few exceptions to that. It wasn't really until the 1990s that Ireland had a, a prolonged and sustained period of economic success. So this was also the era of the Second World War. Sometimes people are surprised that Ireland was neutral during the war, but only two countries in Europe, France and Britain, declared war on Germany, so it wasn't unusual for countries to choose to be neutral. It was felt that like it was only six, how many years, 
18 years since the, the Anglo-Irish War and the British forces had committed some atrocities in Ireland. I think it was a bit soon maybe to expect the people to go, go and join Britain in a war. The situation in Northern Ireland was a, another problem, but there was certainly no um, pro-German sentiment amongst the Irish politicians. There was no question of joining Germany, Germany's side. Now, the IRA did try to cooperate with the Germans during the war. Um, not a lot came of that, but they certainly were in contact with the, the German intelligence. But the IRA had nothing to do with the Irish government. It was a, an illegal organisation and de Valera interned a lot of IRA members during this era. He interned them in a military barracks in the Curra in Central Ireland. So John A. Costello, he was um, twice a Fine Gael Taoiseach during this era as well. He's interesting because he wasn't the leader of Fine Gael. The leader of Fine Gael was Richard Mulcahy, but Mulcahy couldn't be Taoiseach because Fine Gael's coalition partners wouldn't, wouldn't work under him because of stuff that he'd done during the Civil War. He had ordered executions of IRA prisoners. So this gives you an idea of the the type of wounds that are still open and um, the bitterness that still existed in Ireland in 25, almost 30 years after the, the Civil War. So 1957, that was the last election that de Valera won. Um, around about this time, Fianna Fáil are moving away from protectionism. They're starting to um, adopt a more outward-looking economic model. They're trying to attract in foreign direct investment and they're trying to move the economy away from agriculture to industry and services. And most of these changes were implemented under Sean Lamas, who replaced um, de Valera as Taoiseach in 1959. And this was a period of um, strong economic growth for Ireland. Jack Lynch becomes Taoiseach in 1966. This was something of a generational shift. Every All the Taoiseachs up to now had been from the generation around... Um, 1916, 1919 to, to 21. Jack Lynch was from the next generation. He was far too young to have been involved in that era. So Jack Lynch is in charge when the troubles start in Northern Ireland. And I think it's important to clarify what was going on in the Republic during the troubles, because this is relevant when we're talking about Sinn Féin today. The attitude of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael towards Sinn Féin today. I think it's important to just go through this. Okay, so there was one incident in late 1969. It was called the arms crisis when some of Jack Lynch's ministers tried to send money and arms to Catholic communities, including the IRA in Northern Ireland. Now, this was very controversial when it happened and the ministers involved were sacked but I think it's important to realise that this was very early on in the Troubles. Um, everything was still very much in the air. And there was concern that Catholic communities were being uh, were were in danger. And that's what this 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 incident called the Arms Crisis was about. It was about um, defending the Catholic communities. The Provisional IRA hadn't yet started their campaign of shootings and bombings. Now, when things settled down in 1970, a consensus formed in the Republic between the major political parties and the media and the security services about Northern Ireland. So the, let's call these groups the establishment. So the establishment was agreed on this, that they all wanted a united Ireland and they were sympathetic towards the plight of Catholics in Northern Ireland, but they were opposed to the IRA. They didn't support the IRA. And it's important to remember as well that the IRA killed members of the Republic Security Services during the, the Troubles. They didn't often deliberately target members of the police and the army, but there were some exceptions to that in times when they did deliberately target them. Most of the times when police officers and soldiers were killed, it was during bank robberies or shootings, at shootouts following kidnappings or when IRA members were trying when there was an attempt made to um, arrest IRA members. But nonetheless, there were several members of the security forces killed by the IRA. So I think it's important just to, to state that again. Like Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael didn't like the IRA. They don't like the Republican movement. They don't like Sinn Féin, and neither do the media. And so today in 2020, Sinn Féin say that, you know, the media is a bit biased against them. The media doesn't like them. And, you know, there, there, there is some truth to that. And it goes back to this era here in the 1970s. So 1973, Liam Cosgrave, that was the son of um, W.T. Cosgrave. He had a spell as Taoiseach. 
When we get to 1981, there was a significant event in Northern Ireland called the Hunger Strikes, when a number of IRA and INLA prisoners went on hunger strike. Now, this was important for in terms of politics because in order to generate publicity, a number of these hunger strikers, a number of these prisoners stood for election in both um, the Westminster Parliament, the UK Parliament, and also the, the Dublin Parliament. The most notable of these was um, Bobby Sands, who won a seat in Westminster. So at this stage, um, Sinn Féin had basically given up on election politics. Now, these guys, they didn't stand under the Sinn Féin platform, but nonetheless, the Republican movement and Sinn Féin, they saw how well these prisoners had done in these elections, and so they changed their attitudes towards elections, and Sinn Féin started to get involved in elections again. And this was the start of Sinn Féin's long march back to being a, a significant um, political player in the Republic. In the 1980s in the Republic, the, the economy wasn't in great shape. There was nothing new there. But the big story was really the government finances. The government finances were really in a terrible state. Charlie Ho, he would be Taoiseach um, four times during this era. He went on TV in 1980 and he made a famous um, address. He said, we as a nation are living way beyond our means. So he was emphasizing that you know, serious cutbacks needed to be made. Now, despite that, he dragged his feet a little bit. And it wasn't until 1987 that Ireland really started to get on top of this whole um, problem with the government finances. Oh, his great uh, political rival during this era was um, Gareth Fitzgerald. He was um, Taoiseach twice for Fine Gael. So getting back to Hohi, he's Taoiseach in 1987. And that's when things start to get start to get better. And I think the seeds of the economic boom in the 1990s are starting to be sown now. The government finances are getting better. Tax policies are improving, more um, pro-business tax policies. Uh, the EU is spending a lot of money in Ireland in structural funds and motorways, for example. A lot of foreign direct investment, especially US banks, uh, pharmaceutical companies and US tech companies. Um, two other things as well. I think it may seem strange, but I think the success of the Irish football team around this era really started to give the, the country a lift. And in the early 90s, you had the peace process in Northern Ireland as well, the IRA ceasefire. That was 1994. So I think all of these things came together. And that was really what caused the, the boom starting from around 1993. Now, the progressive Democrats... They were a party formed by Des O'Malley, who had been Charlie Hawkey's rival within Fianna Fáil. He was eventually kicked out of the party and he formed this new party. Now, they were quite right wing when it came to the economy. This was the era of um, Thatcher and Reagan, and they were very much for low taxes and um, privatisation and so on. And they had an influence on some governments as well. And I think they may have played a part in sort of the changing the changing political landscape or the changing attitudes towards the economy. Albert Reynolds became Taoiseach in 1991. An unusual situation happened in 1994 when Labour withdrew their support from the coalition they had at Fianna Fáil and switched it to Fine Gael. And John Bruton of Fine Gael became Taoiseach. Okay, so we're into the, the home stretch now. These are the years of the economic boom and Bertie Ahern of Fianna Fáil, he's the Taoiseach during this era. Here's a graph showing the unemployment rate in Ireland. I think this gives a good idea of what was going on with the Irish economy. In case you can't read the figures, in case they're too small, it goes from 1983 on the left to 2019 on the right. So you can see that the unemployment rate was very high in the 80s. And then from 1993 to around 2001, the, the unemployment rate just collapsed and it bottomed out at around 4 or 5%, which is about as low as you're ever going to get it in Ireland. And it stayed down there till around 2007 when it started to pick up again. So 1993 to 2007, that was the, the happy time in Ireland. That was the, the era of the economic boom. Then you had this big crash. Um, a lot of countries were affected by that when Ireland was one of the worst affected because Ireland had its own property bubble crash as well as everything else that was going on. So then things were pretty bad in Ireland until around maybe 2012, things started to improve. And from 2012 on, the economy has been growing strongly and the unemployment rate has been falling. 
So Bertie O'Hearn was the Taoiseach during this era, but he doesn't get any credit for that. Rather, he's he's remembered for not doing enough to to stop the economy overheating and to stop the the crash. He stood down in two thousand and eight after um, a scandal regarding improper payments, and he was replaced by Brian Cowan. Now, he was dealt a really bad hand of cards by fate because soon after he took over, the economy just fell through the floor. And even though he was in a very difficult situation, he's generally regarded as the worst Taoiseach in Ireland's history because he's, he's not believed to have dealt well with the crisis. So when the 2011 election came along, Everyone had known for years that Fianna Fáil were going to get absolutely hammered in the next election because they were blamed for the, the, the economic crash. They were blamed for causing it and they were blamed for not dealing with it well once it had started. So Fine Gael came in. No one was surprised with that. Enda Kenny was the Taoiseach and he, his, the initial stage of his, his term was dealt with dealing with the mess. But then things around 2012, things started to improve. He was re-elected in 2016 and in 2017 um, he was replaced by Leo Varadkar. Varadkar has an unusual background because he's, he's gay and his father is Indian. Varadkar has also developed a, a reputation for being quite, quite right-wing on the economy. He famously said he wanted to be the Taoiseach of people who got up in the morning to go to work. So I think he was criticised unfairly, in my opinion, about that. And he, he has a bit of a reputation, maybe, of being someone who doesn't have a, a lot of sympathy, maybe, for, for people on, on welfare. But under Varadkar, the economy continued to grow, but a major issue has become the housing crisis in Ireland and also the, the health crisis. So not enough houses, um, prices are too high, rents are too high, and the health crisis is the waiting lists, waiting lists to see consultants and um, to see even to see family doctors, GPs, and the trolley crisis, people being left on trolleys in hospital emergency rooms because there's, there's nowhere to, to treat them. Okay, so finally, let's get on to talking a little bit about this election. So there's a lot of information here. Um, I wanted to include the 2007 figures here because that's the last, that was the last normal election in Ireland. Like they are the last, those numbers there that Fianna Fáil got, for example, that's a normal number for Fianna Fáil to get in an election in Ireland. They typically get around 40%. So you can see that they were absolutely hammered at the 2011 election. And they, they started to recover a little bit, up to 27, 27. But they, they, then they started to fall back a little bit, 25. The polls at the bottom, they're the polls that have been um, held since the election was announced. The 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 numbers, they're the average of all the opinion polls in those years. I averaged them out to give a, an idea of the, the changing support in the parties. So you can see that Fianna Fáil, they're, they're nowhere near getting back to what they had. They're still a party that carries this stigma for the, 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 the big crash, and they still haven't recovered from that. The Fine Gael, they did much better in 2011, but they lost a lot of that support afterwards, and they were back to mid-20s, which is typically what Fine Gael have historically gotten. But after Leo Varadkar took over, they were doing quite well, 2018, around 32%, then 2019, 29%. But since the this campaign started, since the election, began they've they've their numbers have been really bad i mean look at that 19 percent it's almost half of what they were uh, or it's it's 50 percent down on what they were in 2018 now there's no real consensus on why that is i think one issue one gaffe that varadkar made was shortly before the election was announced he said he wanted to hold a commemoration event for members of the RIC that were killed during the War of Independence. Now, the RIC was the police force in Ireland when Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. Now, the issue here is that the auxiliaries and the black and tans, which were these notorious British units that committed all sorts of atrocities in Ireland during that time, they were also technically part of the RIC as well. So people started saying, what are you crazy? You want to hold a commemoration for the black and tans? But I think there was a lot of disingenuous, you know, false outrage over this. That's not what Varadkar meant. He, he was talking about like Irish, normal Irish cops that were killed by, by the IRA during 
that era. But nonetheless, it was a it was a public relations disaster for Varadkar. I don't think he dealt with it very well. And then also the fact that he's middle class, I mean, he's a middle class accent. Um, you can tell straight away listening to him, he's a middle class guy from Dublin. And as I said, he has a reputation of being quite right wing, not having a lot of sympathy for the um, people on, on welfare. So I think all these things added up, it's quite easy to maybe portray him or think of him as someone who's out of touch. So, I mean, that's the only thing that I, I, I think that he we can talk about in particular in terms of why Fine Gael's numbers have collapsed. Now, Varadkar has done quite a good job on the economy. The economy has grown and the unemployment rate is low. Why are Sinn Féin surging in the polls then? Well, I think an answer to that is this opinion poll, which was conducted by Ipsos MRBI. So these are, I think this can be interpreted as the most important issues for the electorate. And you can see that health is by far the biggest issue. No one cares about the economy or Brexit. I mean, these are Leo Varadkar's strong points. I mean, everyone's really worried about health, these long waiting lists and these people being left on trolleys in in hospitals because there's no bed for them and housing. People can't get houses. Rents are too high. And I think just Sinn Féin's policies just appeal to people. They just want change and Fianna Fáil are not viewed as being different enough to Fine Gael. And that's the, that's the only thing that I think I can think of that explains the, this lack of support for Fine Gael, despite the fact that the economy is doing well and this surge of support for Sinn Féin. Now, the bookmakers think that they're pretty sure that Fianna Fáil are going to win the most seats. These are the odds from Paddy Power. So they're pretty sure Fianna Fáil are going to win the most seats and Michal Martin's going to be the Taoiseach, but they're not sure how he's going to get there. So there's various combinations. Despite the fact that he's ruled out a coalition with Sinn Féin, the bookmakers still think that's the most likely combination, although it's still odds against. So the, I think the, the various options are Fianna Fáil backed by Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil backed by Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil backed by other parties like Labour, Greens, you know, they may be able to do that with independence. They may not need Sinn Féin or Fine Gael. The other option, an outside option, which would result in Mary Lou Macdonald being Taoiseach, would be Sinn Féin supported by all of the parties except Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. So that would be Sinn Féin plus Labour plus Greens plus Social Democrats plus People Before Profit, Solidarity and the Independents. And I think there is some... I think there is some support for that amongst the parties on the left. Um, this is something that came up in the debates. Um, Richard Boyd Barrett mentioned it, for example, for the first time in the country's history, more than 50% of the population supported parties other than Shin, other than Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. So that's been the story of the 2020 Irish election. There are the three main candidates for Taoiseach. That's Micheál Martin on the left, Leo Varadkar in the middle, and Mary Lou Macdonald, the dark horse who's come from nowhere and has, in the, the last poll, led, Sinn Féin led that poll. It was the first time ever that Sinn Féin have led a poll. Something that I forgot to mention earlier on is that even Sinn Féin themselves have been surprised by how well they've done in the polls, and they're not running a full slate of candidates. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are running 82 candidates. There are 39 constituencies, so that means that those two parties have at least two and sometimes three candidates in every constituency in case they have a very good vote they could win more than one seat now Sinn Féin are only running 42 candidates so it's possible if these polls are correct that Sinn Féin could end up in a situation where they could have won more than one seat in a constituency but they can't because they only ran one candidate Okay, so I think I'll leave it at that. As I said, um, we're not going to get results from this election on Saturday night. It'll be Sunday before we know what, what happened. So um, thanks for watching and until next time.